Hi, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon and welcome to Middlesex University. Uh, my name is Joshua Castellino, I'm uh, Dean of the School of Law and we're delighted to host you here today and thank you for coming at such short notice to really examine with us the legal, moral and other issues involved in this, in this pressing and urgent problem we face in Syria. Uh, we're delighted to really have a, a number of people in the room here with quite a lot of experience. Many of us have worked at various points in Syria as well and really bring that to bear in, in what we're going to do. Before we get to the content of it, I want to start by introducing Don Ferenc. Don is visiting professor at the School of Law at Middlesex and also is head of Planet Good Foundation. And thanks to the involvement of Don, we're going to set up this particular event today and many events to follow. So Don, do you want to just give us in 90 seconds, 90 seconds, yes, a uh, little bit of a taste of the Global Institute and what it does? Yes. In and why seconds. it's relevant as well. In 90 seconds. In your packet, you have an explanation of what the Global Institute for the Prevention of Aggression is. So I don't need to tell you anything further about it. You have a nice little picture of me with a bio, so I don't need to tell you anything further about myself. You can read that on your own. I would like to say that we have got Bill Chavis as the acting academic advisor for the Global Institute for the Prevention of Aggression, which I'm very grateful for. And we have Daphne, Daphne Dimitriou, who I'd like you to please just stand up so people can see you, who is the associate director. And we have Julia Pecarella, as, are you here? Who is the project coordinator for the Global Institute for the Prevention of Aggression. And I'm not gonna take my whole 90 seconds. That's it for me. <laughs> Thank you for coming. That's very efficient, Dawn. I mean, let it not be said, we started on time. We did our first 90 second slot. And that's a promising start. Okay, colleagues, so I mean, essentially we've been following this issue on television for a while now, and many people I think here, like Anas, have been following it, and uh, some other friends in the room as well, who've been following it in a very real sense. And there's all kinds of narratives that are being put with regards to what's happening in Syria. Some are saying this is an inter-ethnic conflict, some are saying that this is a prospect of a new war, with a number of questions we need to ask. What is very clear also is that Syria itself, its boundaries, has a lot to do with colonial boundary drawing, and one of the issues with regards to the Middle East in general is that a lot of the Middle East, even the term, the Middle East, you have to ask middle of what and east of whom. Uh, but even the term the Middle East is a construction, Syria to a certain extent has been a construction. Within that particular construction now, we have a number of issues that have been forthcoming. And I think we want to explore some of those today. Uh, our emphasis is largely going to be on the legal elements of it, but we encourage you to engage with us in debate. We want to keep the debate, we want to keep the spoken part of this in a sense, the delivered part of it, fairly short. Uh, so we will try and contain our comments to the first half hour or so, leaving you plenty of time to engage with us. Uh, normally in these kinds of settings you often operate under the Chatham House rule, but we are podcasting this particular session because there are a number of people who can't be here who'd like it podcast. So if there's anything that you want to say that's off the record, please do put your hand up and we can switch the podcast off for that particular comment. We do want to have a frank and thorough exchange about these issues, so feel free to bring your perspectives and let's engage with them with a degree of honesty and integrity. Uh, without further ado, I want to just call on, on Professor William Shavers. You have bios in your pack, so I'm not going to waste much time on that. But Bill has been on Al Jazeera talking about some of these issues. So Bill, do you want to start off by giving us something of the, the legal elements, especially with the Security Council, on what you see as the, the issues emerging in Syria? Bill. Thank you. Joshua told me this morning, to my surprise, that I had seven minutes to speak, and I've actually, I don't think ever spoken for only seven minutes, but <laughs> um, I, I wanted to talk about a number of the issues, but I, I don't actually think it's, uh, it's, I'll have time to get into some of them, the chemical weapons uh, question, um, and I want to make it clear at the beginning that I'm not going to try and make a case that there is no justification for taking strenuous measures to intervene in the internal affairs of Syria in order to address human rights violations. There's a great report that was issued by the United Nations by the Commission of Inquiry yesterday that adds to all the other material that, uh, that, that explain the fact that terrible human rights violations have been committed and are being committed in Syria. And of course, this is a matter of international concern and interest. I thought about bringing quotes on the, on the uh, on the matter from all these conservative MPs who were so furious about the Special Rapporteur of the United Nations daring to tell the British government that the, the bedroom tax is on, you know, was improper and uh, explaining that no other country has any right to intervene in the internal affairs of another country. 
Um, and these are the same Yahoos who have been proclaiming the need to intervene with force in Syria and elsewhere in the world. But let's put that aside. I want to talk about the, the legal issues involved in the possible intervention without the approval of the United Nations Security Council, which has been put forward by the British government, defended by the Prime Minister and by others. Um, I have, um, first of all, this is the legal advice that was, uh, was issued on the 29th of August as being the UK government position. And it says, and I'm quoting the relevant part, if action in the Security Council is blocked, the UK would still be permitted under international law to take exceptional measures in order to alleviate the scale of the overwhelming humanitarian catastrophe in Syria. What is being stated there is that in effect you could use force uh, against another state without abiding by the Charter of the United Nations, which authorizes the use of force in only two circumstances. One is with the authorization of the Security Council, which, we don't, which is not present, and the other is in the exercise of the legitimate right of self, the inherent right of self-defense, which is in the Charter of the United Nations, but obviously does not apply to the United Kingdom in the case of Syria. There have been subsequent uh, statements along the same lines. David Cameron, at the end of the G20 meeting, spoke about the two requirements in the international law in the Charter of the United Nations and said that it would be, quote, a dangerous precedent to confine the right to intervene to the Charter of the United Nations. So I think, actually, that it's a dangerous precedent to start to say that there are loopholes or exceptions in the United Nations Charter. But that's Cameron speaking a week ago at the end of the G20 meeting. There have been similar statements. One was published in The Guardian yesterday by a number of what The Guardian called the Grandees. I don't know if that's an official organization, but, you know, senior important people in various political parties uh, also taking that position. And there's a report in The Guardian also um, a day or so ago where they referred to Daniel Bethlehem, who used to be the legal advisor to the, um, uh, to the Foreign Office, uh, again, essentially confirming what Cameron had said the other day. So is that the case? Um, and uh, is that, and has that consistently been the British position? Because that's what Daniel Bethlehem this has always been our position. We've never backed down on it. And the debate goes back to the intervention by NATO uh, in the former Yugoslavia and Serbia and uh, at the time of the, uh, what we call the Kosovo War in 1999, when there was an intervention without Security Council uh, authorization. Subsequently, there was an international commission, which everybody's fond of citing, that was set up, an informal body uh, that was organized by the Canadian government and said that Although it was not lawful, bear that in mind, conceded, it's acknowledged that it was not lawful, uh, the expression was, it may be legitimate under what has now been come to be called the responsibility to protect. So lawful but not legitimate, and this is one of the arguments that people keep falling back on. I, I, I think at law school, I missed the day when they explained how you can do things that are legitimate but not, not lawful. But this is the, essentially the basis of the, of the argument. Um, and then the next stage in this, of course, was the intervention in Iraq in 2003. But there's a significant difference because the British always maintained that the intervention in Iraq in 2003 was done by virtue of a Security Council resolution. It was a contrived argument, but their argument was not that they had the right to intervene in Iraq without the authorization of the Security Council. They pinned it, and this was their legal advice that was subsequently published in The Guardian, they pinned it on, and, and Blair presented it to Parliament as being justified because of the Security Council resolution. So that's no precedent at all for me. And then the next step in 2005 was the adoption of the principle of the responsibility to protect by the United Nations General Assembly, um, adopted by consensus, so the United Kingdom government participated in the consensus. And there's a famous paragraph in the resolution that was adopted by the General Assembly that speaks of the responsibility to protect, about the importance of intervening when a government fails to protect its own population, and makes it clear that this is entirely contingent on abiding by the Charter of the United Nations. No exception is recognized. And at the time, there were many who were dissatisfied with that because it was not part of the agreement. I suppose one could say that although it's not part of the agreement, it's not excluded either. 
and that may be the argument that the Foreign Office will then hinge their position on in the British government. But I would submit that there are other uh, uh, significant developments in international law which bind the United Kingdom where we can say that that avenue is closed and that it's wrong and dishonest and incorrect to maintain that the United Kingdom has consistently held the position that it can intervene without abiding by the Charter of the United Nations. I want to go back uh, many, many years now, more than 60 years, to the first contentious decision of the International Court of Justice issued in a case called the Corfu Channel case. This was a case that was filed uh, that, 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 that took place between the United Kingdom and Albania, and it was, it was related to the fact that Albania had mined the Corfu Channel, which was an international strait. The two countries went before the court by agreement. They went by agreement. They agreed on what the legal debate would be. Uh, one of the reasons for that was that Albania was not yet a member of the United Nations, and it wasn't yet a member of the International Court of Justice. So the British said that Albania had violated international law by mining the channel, and Albania said that Britain had violated international law by going in and sweeping up the channel afterwards. I, I, I'm sorry to dwell on that, but it's important because when you go to court and you agree on what the legal issue is, you're bound by the decision. If you don't want to go, if you don't want to go, if you don't want to be bound by the decision, you shouldn't go to court in the first place. And here's what the International Court of Justice said dealing with Albania's complaint against the United Kingdom in 1949. The court can only regard the alleged right of intervention as the manifestation of a policy of force such as has in the past given rise to most serious abuses and such as cannot, whatever be the present defects of international organization, find a place in international law. Intervention is perhaps still less admissible in the particular form it would take here for from the nature of things it would be reserved for the most powerful states and might easily lead to perverting the administration of international justice itself. That's 1949. I don't think international law has changed on that in that respect at all since 1949. But I want to draw your attention to something quite recent. I mentioned already the fact that the United Kingdom agreed with the responsibility to protect resolution of the General Assembly, which limits so-called humanitarian intervention to the framework set by the Charter of the United Nations. There is no other exception, contrary to what Cameron and Batman and others seem to be suggesting. And that is the <laughs> adoption of amendments to the statute of the International Criminal Court dealing with the crime of aggression. And Don Ferencz and I were both there and present in the room when all of this happened at the diplomatic conference in Kampala uh, three years ago. Uh, the definition of aggression that was adopted by the International Court of Justice speaks of the bombardment of a state uh, and by another state and says that this would be the crime of aggression, providing that it is uh, a manifest violation of the Charter of the United Nations. I can't think what could be a more manifest violation of the Charter of the United Nations than saying we can't do this pursuant to the Charter of the United Nations. Uh, we, we've argued for some time about whether the invasion of Iraq could be qualified as a manifest violation of the Charter of the United Nations. And the reason why there's a little debate about that is because of this argument that the invasion might have been justified by a Security Council resolution. But in this case, there's no attempt to pin it on the Charter of the United Nations. There's an acknowledgment that it's contrary to the Charter or not permitted by the Charter of the United Nations. So it's what could be a better example of a manifest violation. Now, at the end of the resolution, there is something that we call understanding. The understandings are, uh, it's, it's a little bit of uh, salt that international uh, negotiators put on a treaty when they adopt it. It's not part of the treaty, but it's to assist, it's to give a flavor, to assist in the interpretation of the treaty. The Americans came to the conference uh, in Kampala saying, we think there should be an understanding to protect humanitarian intervention, even if it's not authorized by the Security Council of the United Nations. I have the draft in my files. It was not an official document, but it was circulated. And they said, we want to have that exception put into the understandings of the definition of aggression. And they said, any use of force that is intended to prevent a violation of the statute of the International Court, uh, Criminal Court, in other words, to prevent genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes, would not be a manifest violation of the charge. <coughs> 
that was proposed. It's not in there. And I have the final text that, that's here. They were unsuccessful in making any progress on that. There was great resistance for many, many states. And finally, the Americans themselves were forced to agree that on a much diluted clause that refers to the Charter of the United Nations. What does this mean for the United Kingdom? Well, the United Kingdom adopted that, that statement. Those understandings were agreed to by the United Kingdom. They've not been ratified yet by the government of the United Kingdom, but they were voted without objection by the United Kingdom. And so I think that this is further evidence uh, to show that it's, it's wrong for the United Kingdom to maintain that they've always taken the position that they could intervene without the authorization of the Charter of the United Nations. I want to say one final, uh, one final remark on this, because it, it is held up, and, and this is a, a classic argument. We hear it all the time in this context. Yes, but there's terrible human suffering. The Security Council is blocked. What are we to do? We have to go outside the Security Council. It's an argument that gets used by powerful states sometimes. Not always. They don't do it consistently. They don't do it when there are human rights violations in other countries or when there are human rights violations in areas that uh, concern their sphere of influence and where they don't want any international meddling. The idea that there's a veto, I mean, the, the Russians and the Chinese get all the blame for the veto. Does everybody know who uses the veto in the Security Council of the United Nations? Historically, for the first 10 or 15 years, it was the Russians who used the veto, and then they basically stopped. And ever since, since 1970, the biggest client for the veto is the United States of America. But the impression was given in the press, very mistakenly, that it's the Russians and the Chinese who are always vetoing everything. So the veto, I mean, it's a repulsive notion. It's undemocratic. Everybody hates it. I hate it. And yet, it's one of those things. Uh, it's the worst possible, it's like Churchill said, it's the worst possible thing except for the alternatives. And the alternative uh, right now, if you take out the veto, is to say that countries will take the law into their own hands, uh, which is a terrible prospect. And I think that the um, that that system, as imperfect as it is, uh, as a package, the Charter of the United Nations, which should not be touched, which is sacred, which is the which is international law, which is the core of international law, has if if it has not guaranteed us a period of seventy years of of absolute peace since 1945, 68 years, what it has done is prevented a third world war. And so people who just casually slough off the charter saying, oh, no, no, that, that, that's a, we have a blockage in the, in the Security Council. We have to do something. Wouldn't it be good not to have that veto anymore? Um, should weigh that against all of the other, uh, the, the problem that uh, we're allegedly going to resolve uh, which is the need to address a terrible humanitarian catastrophe in Syria, uh, that there would be a terrible price to pay, I think, by giving in to this demagogy of, of uh, David Cameron saying that, that this is a dangerous idea, the Charter of the United Nations. But the dangerous idea is Cameron's idea. Thank you. Thank you. Hear from Anas now, who's been involved with some of the humanitarian efforts, I think. So, give us your perspective right, on, on these issues. Thanks very much. Um, before talking about some of the legalities, uh, I won't probably cover them as much as uh, my fellow panelists did right now. I will just give you guys a quick recap of the past two and a half years. Most of you guys already know uh, what's been going on, but the reason I want to give that recap is because it puts things in context. So, as you guys know, in March 2011, uh, in the spirit of the Arab Spring, many Syrians decided to take uh, to the street to protest a 40-year-old uh, dictatorship, to protest a policing government, and to ask for some more freedoms and more plurality. It started off as quite a peaceful uh, movement. It started off as an uprising by students, uh, unions, and, and civil society. However, the regime responded uh, with heavy force, uh, with bullets, uh, firing innocent and peaceful protesters, jailing a lot of them, torturing a lot of them, and even escalating that to using heavier weapons sometimes we flatten entire neighborhoods. Now obviously that did drag the entire nation into a war that we now all know now a lot about. Um, but the reason I mention this is because a lot of the anti-war camp seems to be concerned about 
not driving a nation into a war that's destructive. Forgetting that nations have already been driving into that war. Forgetting that Syrians, even the ones who are calling for intervention right now, never wanted that to start with. Never wanted even the least of uh, a civil conflict, let alone a long blown war. And the fact that the Syrian regime has pushed the entire nation into that situation has to be kept in mind when we think of avoiding any destruction. Destruction has already been brought to Syrians. According to the UN, we have now over 120,000 deaths and fatalities, 5 million internally displaced, and Syria is only 20 million. When you say 5 million, that's a lot of Syrians internally displaced. 2 million refugees, um, half of them are children. And many accounts by um, Amnesty and Human Rights Watch of how rape was being used as a weapon by Assad regime and his militias. So that kind of destruction has gone beyond any other humanitarian crisis. According to the UN, it's the greatest humanitarian crisis we have right now. So the idea that avoiding an intervention because it would bring destruction to Syria is kind of denying the fact that the past two and a half years has already brought destruction, and the fact that we do not do any, if we do not stop Assad, he will only carry on doing more because he's been doing it with complete immunity. The second reason why I mentioned this is because the, uh, the idea of intervention not just about to happen now. Whether the West, America, France, whoever, intervenes or not, intervention has already started. Russia and its allies in the region have been intervening in, in the actual conflict for the past two and a half years. Russia has been providing diplomatic cover, has been providing the military aid and financial aid for the Syrian regime. And Iran and Hezbollah have been openly supporting Assad and, some, and openly even saying they have their men fighting side to side with Assad militias. So the idea that internationalizing the crisis by getting the UN Security Council involved and getting a resolution to intervene and stop Assad's war crimes would be internationalizing it and bring it into uh, the international, making more of an international conflict is also kind of, kind of a ridiculous comment because it has already been internationalized and has already been dragged to neighboring countries and beyond. Um, and to that point, I would have loved to see a lot of the anti-war activists at one point protesting the anti the war in Syria throughout the past two years, or the anti-interventionist activists uh, protesting the intervention of Russia, Iran, and other allies of that camp when they've been intervening in Syria. So having said that, going back to the legality of intervention, um, as my fellow panelist has covered already, Syria does in many ways, he hasn't probably agreed with me 100% on that, but Syria in many ways is a textbook case for responsibility to protect in terms of a nation that hasn't, has, as a government has failed uh, to protect its own people from genocide, well not genocide yet, massacres, war crimes, uh, a sort of ethnic cleansing in certain neighborhoods and homes, um, and not only has it prevented, but it's actually been actively part of it. Um, and the fact that that has been going on and hasn't been stopped for the past few years and every diplomatic effort has failed and the regime has only been escalating it from 5,000 people dead in 2011 and right now we're at 5,000 a month um, and escalating the type of weapons as all of you guys know the use of chemical weapons recently that clearly shows that the international community has to act and responsibility to protect is a very legal sound argument to make and going back to the fact that even though Syria would fit with that legal argument and that, 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 that ethical and moral argument uh, for responsibility to protect, it would not pass in any UN resolution because of the Security Council, because of the structure of the Security Council, because of the five permanent members and the veto. And although my fellow panelists think, believes that this is the best we can get, I believe we could do better than that. I believe that, obviously, we're not expecting right now in this discussion or any future discussions to change that system, but you can see the frustration from Syrians where they believe that it's easy to argue the legal case, but because of a five members chess game, where it turns out to a chess game where each member just vetoes the other person's own resolutions to fulfill their own personal agendas. And yes, the state has been the one using it the most. And yes, the state has used it against Israel numerous times to protect Israel from any Security Council resolution. And that's equally bad and equally wrong. And that's, that's, that is the point. That's equally frustrating for the Palestinians and equally frustrating for Syrians now. The fact that it's easy to argue the legality of it, but it's difficult to act on the legality of it because we UN, UNC's uh, structure. So, I mean, I, at this point, I'm not, I'm not a legal expert to add much to that, but I'm just trying to kind of get across to you guys frustration of Syrians when they feel like someone tells them, well, it's illegal for us to intervene and protect you, so we're going to just stand by and keep on trying to make the effort as the regime escalates. Um, finally, I'd like to make a couple comments in terms of comparisons that have been going on in the media and by the activists 
uh, who've been resisting or, or, or protesting any 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 uh, intervention, uh, the anti-war camp, stop the war camp, basically. And the comparison has been going on over the past few weeks between is between Syria and Iraq. And back in 2003, when I was a student uh, at the University of Toronto, I was actually in the front lines of the <coughs> war movement uh, against Iraq. As much as I despised Saddam Hussein, as much as I despised the Ba'ath Party in Iraq, I did know that that was an illegal war, fought for, the, for legal reasons, and done for the wrong reason and the wrong way. But there is a big difference between Syria and Iraq right now. Um, to summarize these differences, first of all, Saddam Hussein in 2003 was not an active war against his own people. It was not actively committing uh, crimes against humanity. It was not actively gassing the people, at least not in 2003. He's done that in the past, but not in 2003. It was relatively a stable country at that point, and it was relatively, as much as he was a, dicta a dictator, suppressing, oppressing his own people and probably jailing some uh, political distance, but he was not actively committing war crimes. The second difference uh, between Syria and Iraq is that in 2003, Iraq was not undergoing an uprising, a revolution, a people's uprising, uh, demanding change, for, demanding change of government and demanding uh, uh, more freedoms. And the fact that that's going on in Syria changes the entire context because it's no longer an imported idea. It's no longer states coming in and forcing an idea on the Iraqi people. It's a two and a half year old conflict that the Syrian people have not given up yet and they've been demanding for that. It's gone bloody, it's gone messy, and both camps now have their own problems and mistakes. But the vast majority of the blame is still on the Assad regime for dragging the country to where we are right now and not fulfilling his duties to either protect his people or step down when he failed to do so. Um, so that is that makes the comparison with Iraq and Syria very wrong, in my opinion, and makes it, uh, although it's easy to compare them because maybe they're neighboring, they have very similar history in terms of, so I speak on the divisions of, of, of the, uh, the borders and the ethnic composition, but it makes it from a political and war crime point of view, makes it very different. A more accurate comparison might be Bosnia, it might be Rwanda, but not Iraq. Um, so finally, I want to make that point that there seems to be this view that resisting any intervention is the anti-imperialist thing to do. And it seems to be the imperialism defined by any Western involvement. And as much as I believe that many Western powers have many imperialist, uh, uh, imperialist agendas in the Middle East. But right now, in the reality of Syria, speaking to many Syrians I have spoken to in bordering countries or even inside Syria recently, um, many of them would tell you that right now they feel the imperialist power in the region, in their country, is Russia. And it's the one exerting the most force it has on Syria for its own personal agendas, for its own personal uh, uh, strategic uh, influence in the region. So the idea of fighting imperialism is a good thing, but it should not be a one-sided uh, fight. And that, that message is mainly for the anti-war camp, that I have always been part of, but right now I'm quite disappointed at, uh, for failing um, to speak up for, for the Syrian people and their country to go on. So I know there's a lot of questions going to be later on about um, the FSA. There's going to be a lot of questions about what happens next. There's going to be a lot of questions about who to support and how to support. And I happily answer these questions, but just want to give you guys a brief overview of what many Syrians have been frustrated with. Thank you, Anas. That's great. So, colleagues, what we've got to is uh, Bill arguing that there is no legal justification for intervention in Syria. Anas saying that there has been intervention already of various different kinds. This is just a question of whether the UN should, be, should intervene. But the other question that is relevant is really why now? Uh, and one of the arguments made is it's because chemical weapons have been used. So, Agbira, can you tell us a little bit about whether or not this is the so-called red line, the chemical weapons use? and how significant that is for this debate. Um, well, um, I have been thinking a bit of uh, how the argument on possessing weapons, on using weapons, seem to have been used increasingly in recent times as some kind of legal cover to uh, at least threaten with the use of force, okay? Um, and also, this morning, I remember by chance, a, a few years ago, I did some um, research on, the, on a program of NATO that's uh, still ongoing, and it's going to be ongoing until 2020, I think is the day, on non-lethal weapons. And at the time, I was looking at it from the perspective of torture and how non, the use of non-lethal weapons and the development of the NATO program 
will actually involve a, a, a breach of, a, a, of the rule that prohibits torture. But I remember particularly a research paper of NATO that was with different um, scenarios, operational scenarios, and how you will deal with them. Okay, so one of them was incredibly similar, incredibly similar to Syria now. So I'm going to give you the solution of the textbook case. Okay? I want to give you the solution to the problem. In this scenario, the scenario, the key objectives are to secure weapons of mass destruction materials, protect civilians from threats posed by the dictator and his regime, and to address the threat posed by terrorists. Easy, yeah? The first objective, so the weapons of mass destruction, will involve preventing movement by land, sea, and air, capturing and controlling facilities, and seizing or sealing, neutralizing weapons of mass destruction material. The second objective, mean uh, protect civilians from threats posed by the dictator, will involve facilitating the release of human shields, capturing or neutralizing guards, and denying or degrading the regime's ability to move, sense, or communicate. And the final objective, which is address the threat posed by terrorists, will include identifying, marking, tracking, and seizing, neutralizing terrorists. Associated with the objectives are a couple of overarching constraints. Avoiding the release or dissemination of weapons of mass destruction materials and minimizing civilian casualties. Okay? So in theory, we have a way and we have a, an operational plan to deal with uh, this kind of a scenario, and the constraints come from different angles. But again, coming back from this, what has happened recently to have this kind of a scenarios considered as a justification to intervene in another uh, country. And I, it has been cited, Iraq, when we uh, started discussing in the media uh, why we were intervening in Iraq and when uh, the countries had to make their case at the United Nations, the weapons of mass destruction were clearly the main argument. And here, Professor Castellino likes to joke about people looking for weapons of mass destruction with their gloves in a truck, and all of us looking at the PowerPoint presentation in the Security Council. Um, but as Bill Shavas has also reminded us, there was some legal grounds based on a Security Council resolution that was requesting the regime of Saddam Hussein to disarm itself, okay? On the 14th of July, 2013, so a few months ago, the, prime, the Israeli Prime Minister also presented uh, in the United Nations his case for a possible unilateral intervention using armed force in Iran, alleging this red line that was crossed. So apparently when the um, Iranian regime gets to certain level, that's the red line, uh, Israel feels that they will be legitimized legally to intervene even without the United States, and they said that because the red line has been crossed. And now we have again this argument of the red line crossed on the chemical weapon. So what is the red line? Okay. Um, contrary to nuclear weapons, which are not clearly banned in every case and in international law, at least International Court of Justice didn't leave it very, didn't make it very clear and left some kind of a space there and we don't have a proper treaty or anything like that. For the case of chemical weapons, it is clearly established in international law and mainly in two conventions, um, 1925 protocol and the 1993 Chemical Weapons Convention that the use, the stockpiling of chemical weapons is illegal, okay? Um, so that's not, it becomes much more complicated in practice and I might end saying a couple of things about that, but in principle and definitely the kind of use of chemical weapons that is alleged to have um, happened in Syria will be covered by this prohibition, okay? Um, 
But that's not the problem. The problem is, since when a stockpiling weapons of mass destruction or prohibit advanced weapons has become enough to attack another country. And very few countries have actually put their case forward on this. So the British, we have to commend them on this. They have stated the legal position and they have tried at least to argue legally why they could intervene. They have used humanitarian intervention. We might not agree with the argument. We might also say it is not, as Bill Shevas has put very well, it's not really establishing, it's not really stating the opinion Yuri is calling law of the United Kingdom because they have not been consistent with this. But if we look at the United States and the draft Obama was going to submit to the Congress, there's no real justification. Obama explained to us, or explained to the Congress, why what Syria was doing was illegal, which is very clearly illegal, but does not explain very well why the United States will be able to intervene. Only as an indirect argument that I have heard Obama now in two, three interviews, and is also present in the draft, almost hidden, like an obiter dicta, is that the use, the possession and the use of chemical weapons is threatening us, as the Americans, okay? So it's trying to make somehow some kinds of self-defense, okay? And many commentators have also tried to make that argument that one of the possible legal bases to intervene by force in um, Syria <coughs> would be that the use of chemical weapons by their own nature, and that makes them different because they are invisible, they are poisonous, they, they, they can derive on long-term damage, can difficult, it's very difficult to control the damage close border, okay? So in which point crossing the border this could be considered an attack on neighboring countries and therefore other allies can help them and therefore you have a case for collective self-defense. Um, it would be interesting to, before making these cases, academically, I think, that people bother at least to see what other countries are saying. And I have to disagree with you. It's not true that the neighboring countries in general are agreeing with the intervention, okay? Jordan has made very, very clear, and they are taking a lot of refugees, and they are taking a lot, they, they must be quite scared of what's happening too. They have made very clear they don't want an intervention. They don't want their territory to be a launch pad for an intervention. Turkey seems to be, the president at least, the public opinion doesn't seem to follow him, but the president is pro-intervention. Uh, Lebanon is extremely divided. Uh, Iraq seems to be against intervention. So Iran is clearly against intervention. So, and the Arab League has moved in the last week three times. So uh, it is, we should look also what other countries are saying, because we are only focusing on the British and the um, uh, American position, and obviously the French who have not really even explained their position, but uh, they are favoring this uh, intervention. I, I want to finish here, there will be other questions that can come, but I do believe you, I mean, Anthony Cullen is here, will be much smarter than me at making the case. There's a case that nobody makes when speaking about this case that could be a case of self-determination, probably. There's some little scope for the use of force if you make the argument that the majority of the population, due to gross violations of human rights, is actually fighting for the right to self-determination against a minority of Alawites. I mean, you could make that case in law, but people don't seem to be making that particular case. Um, in any case, we are still confronted at the end of the day with two basic things. So either what's, go what is be what's going to be the precedent? Either if we do something or we don't do anything. So if we don't do anything, and when we don't do anything means when we don't intervene by for armed force, because there are many other things that can be done. If we don't intervene by armed force, is that sending a message to the international community that you can use chemical weapons against your own population without expecting a strike bite almost of the same dimension. 
Okay. Are we going to see the Saddam Hussein in 1988? So this Assad now, uh, is this going to be repeating itself through history that we had all these uh, chemical weapons attacks and nothing happened? Okay. But the second president, as Professor Shevas has said, is also very scary. Are we going to now be in a world where having weapons of mass destruction or using some kind of weapons means automatically that some other country feels entitled to use form a force unilaterally and this is considered legal. So I'm going to leave it here and I'm sure we'll have an interesting discussion. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so we're going to open it up for questions, but before we start that, can we just do a show of hands? How many people in the room are for intervention? Okay, we'd like to hear from you. How many people in the room are against intervention? And I presume there are people who are undecided. I presume that's the third category. Okay, can we hear first from those who are pro-intervention? Why? And can you, can you give us some indication as to why you are pro-intervention? <coughs> I'm not very aware of the law, so you're gonna have to excuse me. I'm, I'm only following the humanitarian idea and the fact that my husband is Syrian, so I'm very attached to the country, to his people, and I've been following from day one the events that have been developing in Syria. And as much as we were against about any international action at the beginning, I think it's now necessary. I think it's gonna stop any further pain, any further loss, as crazy as it sounds. Because it kind of sounds crazy to get an intervention, a which means sort of death, to stop deaths. I know it sounds, it's an idea that I would have never thought a few months ago that I will be at this point. But I think that something big has to be done to stop this, this man for killing any more of our children. Um, because it's, it's our people, it's our family, it's our friends. Um, and we are the voices. So there's nothing legal because I'm, I don't understand about law. So okay. that's my point of view. Thank you. Yeah, again, so this is a, as a Syrian, um, to argue the same point as Susanna, like, this is what the Syrian people are arguing for. They don't want a boots on the ground, so like the pros. We've been asking for help for a long time, and it's, it is creating a, a divide where there is hate for the West because we've been asking for some help and we feel like ignored, like we feel like we don't matter. We, it's fine to swipe us off the country, it's, mm -hmm. we're just being killed regardless. Um, get a bit know anything about the law, but the humanitarian aspect, sort of, the escalation of the crimes that are being committed, um, I think this is the only way to stop it. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we, are, you, are you also for the intervention? No. Can we hear from somebody who's against the intervention first? And I'll come back to you, Nada. Yeah, go ahead, Nada. Go ahead. Um, you know, I just have a short question and a comment. As somebody who was in the war very similar to the one in Syria, and I was there throughout the war and after the war, then I came here, I just wanted to ask um, whether anybody can explain, um, have they discussed what this intervention would be? Is this just a, a military intervention? Does that intervention stop after changing the regime, after bombing? Because it's very really easy. I don't think there's any problem with military intervention. I think they've mapped up everything. They know all sides where things are, and it's just a matter of pressing se several buttons. But what happens then? Because intervention doesn't come without price, yeah. as far as I can see. And does it mean that uh, people need long-term intervention with rebuilding the country, with uh, teaching them Western-style values, because nobody is going to intervene unless you adopt their way of thinking, their um, way of behaving, and their laws and regulations. Okay. Yeah. So that is what I said. Can we come back to that question? So that's a question of what kind of intervention. Let's come back to that. Can we just hear from some uh, anybody, a couple of voices of people who are against the intervention and why? Don. Just to raise a simple back question. Back. Let's take a hypothetical. Let's say the United States does a missile strike in the country. Under the Charter of the United Nations, Syria has a perfect right to defend itself under Article 51 by launching a counterstrike in Washington or New York. Let's think about that. Yeah. One thing I said might be a kind of drawback to the discussion today. And my own concern 
about this issue has been on the authenticity of the evidence we have on hand. Everyone has just bought into the idea based on US intelligence that it was Assad that used this chemical weapon. But my question is that, um, from what I know, I do consider science, and from what I know about intelligent people, they can be fabricated. You know, I mean, I can take your picture and show the image processing and show that you're somewhere in the US and you committed a crime while you're in the UK. So everyone's not, everyone seems not to be concerned about the concerns that Putin and, and China, Russia and China are raising, which is, are there possibility that the people we call rebels who um, have a Qaeda in their midst, can they use this chemical weapon? They have the capacity to launch a chemical weapon and pump. If that is yes, and if there is a one percent chance that they have that capacity, then I think we should take that chance because what is going to happen is that we all agree that Assad is responsible for this attack. If it happens, just as it happened in Iraq, and in the next five years we find out that oh, it was not actually correct. That will empower Al Qaeda, will empower the rebels led by Al Qaeda, will put chemical weapons in their hand. So, first of all, we should be clear. We should be clear of who needs this chemical weapon. Are we making our assessment based on U.S. report? Are there other intelligence agencies from other countries like Russia and China who also have counterintelligence that it could be rebels that use this? Now, if we are clear about that and we are According to law, from, from what I know about law, Assad is still a suspect. We've condemned him without giving him a fair hearing. He's still a suspect of a chemical weapon attack. That is my number one concern, which um, still, since this whole politics of chemical weapon is going on, nobody has actually cleared that. We all put into the idea of CNN, BBC, Assad is responsible, let's crucify Assad. We, we are talking about rebels, we are talking about people who are fighting for human rights. They are there are kind of elements in their midst. I've seen videos where the people we call rebels got people, execute them and kill them. That's also a war crime. So people that have capacity of doing that, I still believe that they can use chemical weapon. And if at all that there is a one percent probability that they use this chemical weapon and we attack Assad, then we have empowered um, uh, Al Qaeda, we created another Osama bin Laden this time around with a chemical weapon. That's okay. my number one point. Secondly, the, if if the U.S. attack um, attack um, um, Syria based on this without getting a UN resolution, I'm also looking at the precedent the U.S. will create because tomorrow Russia can say that there are about ten intelligence that Israel or any other country has violated an international law and they bypass your resolution and attack the country. So these are the two things that are kind okay, of great. giving me concern. Yeah. Thank you very much. You should be doing law, not computer science. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, a minute each then, a minute each to respond to some of the issues that have been raised and we'll go back to the floor. Please, um, Can I go out to the last, last speaker first? Up to you, right. yeah. Okay, so um, first question about the, the chemical weapons. I mean, um, it is actually quite insulting in many ways to the victims of a crime when, when you tell them that they've killed themselves to prove a point. When you tell a bunch of Syrians that they have brought in some chemical weapons, bombed in their own areas, because everyone who died in that attack was actually in the rebel-held areas. So to go ahead and say that they've actually killed themselves, to prove a point is quite insensitive towards the actual, the actual victims. Now, we have to wait for the UN uh, reports to come out uh, uh, before we make judgment of who, who use the chemical weapons. However, from very basic analysis of what the chemical weapons, what it takes to employ them, the kind of technology it takes, the kind of uh, storage and deployment of these weapons, rebels with AK-47, if they have them, and if they are saying that they are dominant by Al-Qaeda, which is, by the way, not true, it's just been exaggerated media, but if you say that, Al-Qaeda has bigger fish to fry. They wouldn't go bomb these new chemical weapons they own in areas that are anti-Assad. So from basic logic, out of the logical situations going on, this argument is not that strong. However, when I was talking about making the argument for intervention, I didn't even bring up the chemical weapons. Because I want to argue that the intervention should happen because of the death so far of over 120,000. 1,400 died because of the chemical, chemical weapons. 120,000 died of conventional weapons. 
And the idea that we shouldn't intervene because we have to wait for the chemical weapons, so for the, for the, for the finance of the evidence before we know the culprit, does not rule out, we all, we all know the planes, who owns the planes, who owns the artillery, who owns the torture chambers, who owns all the ships and planes that have been used to flatten entire cities that rose up against the south. These are crimes against humanity. These are atrocities that should be stopped and intervened for, regardless of the chemical weapons. And like I said, going back to chemical weapons, it does sound illogical for the, a bunch of AK-47 rebels to just suddenly own them and have the know-how how to operate them and then use it on themselves just to prove a point. So, but again, we can just wait until that comes out. But that, that's my response to that question. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Bill, do you want to well, address some of the issues? I think that's the, I agree, and I, I with what Alex has just said, and I think that's the problem with your um, focusing too much on the chemical weapons. I think the chemical weapons, they're more of a red herring than a red line. Yeah. Um, the, the Assad was responsible for atrocities in Syria throughout the war and even prior to the war. And I would like nothing better than to see the end of him. I'm also totally in agreement. I want to do everything I can to help those who uh, want to replace him with a democratic government. And I've already made, a, I think, a significant contribution. I, I'm not going to discuss what it is, but I've tried to help. But uh, the, what intrigues me is this obsession from the United Kingdom, the United States, and some other countries with the chemical weapons. Why is this such a red line? Um, we had the news yesterday that finally, and Obama seems to think this is a cool idea too, Putin says, I'm going to get Syria to ratify the Chemical Weapons Convention. Great, you know, it's a widely ratified convention. I think all but six countries in the world have ratified it. Syria is one of them. Syria's position is, and it's been this for years, we'll ratify it when our neighbor ratifies it, okay? Because Syria has a neighbor that has chemical weapons, and without wanting to justify Syria's behavior, it's not the most unreasonable thing in the world when you're in a state of war with your neighbor who has chemical weapons and is also not ratifying the convention to do that. I also think that the, the, the obsession of the Americans, Obama said it yesterday in his most recent statement, he said, he said, we have to deal with chemical weapons because of the humanitarian issue, the 1,400 victims in Syria, and because it protects our troops abroad, which, by the way, is not self-defense. You know, the United States has a right to self-defense, but it doesn't extend to protecting their troops abroad, okay? And that's really, I think, this is why this is such a big deal in the red line. Uh, it's because, as far as the United States is concerned, there should only be one weapon of mass destruction in the world, the one that they have and that they monopolize, okay, and not chemical weapons. Uh, just one last note on this, because people have talked, we haven't spoken about the role the International Criminal Court would play, but I heard someone on Radio 4 this morning say, well, the first thing to do is to get the International Criminal Court to deal with the, with the situation of chemical weapons. There's a hole in the statute of the International Criminal Court. It has provisions dealing with prohibited weapons, but it doesn't deal properly with chemical weapons. And that's because there were many states when the, when the Rome statute was being negotiated who said, we should make it an international crime to use any weapon that causes unnecessary suffering or superfluous harm or that is indiscriminate. That's the rule of international law, customer international law, any weapon that causes unnecessary suffering or superfluous harm or that is indiscriminate. And some of the countries, six of them in particular, objected, saying, we can't have that rule, because then we'll have three judges of the International Criminal Court who might decide that nuclear weapons meet that test. And so then other countries, and my recollection is Syria was one of them, said, well, if you're not going to prohibit the rich man's weapon of mass destruction, you can't prohibit the poor man's either. And that's, where, that's what's underpinning this big debate, and that's why it's being called the red line. It's not the red line. There was a humanitarian disaster, a terrible emergency in Syria, and the issue, and I, the only, if we have a little disagreement, it's only on the fact that I'm saying intervention, fine, but when everybody agrees. Uh, and that's aside from this other difficult question is, the form it would take. Because we know what the United States are going to do. They're going to fire off a bunch of Tomahawk missiles. We know that, that Assad, by the way, he didn't need to build good bomb shelters to protect himself against the United States. He built them a long time ago to protect himself against his neighbor. So he's, you know, 
he knows what to do when someone attacks him. It's going to be uh, innocent victims in Damascus, I'm afraid, who will be. So this is the problem of mapping out what exactly you do. And it's a very complicated matter, as we all understand, so that I can assist the Syrian opposition by giving them legal advice, OK? But I'm not sure how to do it by getting a Kalachnikov and going off and joining them on the ground. I'm not sure how that will work. But your insurance wouldn't cover you, just for the record. Um, by the way, but there's, there's, one, there's one question that still remains. I mean, Susanna is saying, Elvira, I mean, what about the fact that there's, there's been two and a half years of death and destruction? Um, she says that's justification enough for intervening here and now, irrespective of the legality. Um, I. I... I do, I mean, I want to stop, I want to ask for that, but I, I do believe too that through the focusing on chemical weapons and everything is just making a disfavor to the Syrian population and uh, to everybody because the, 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 if we are really, really lucky at the end of it, the chemical weapons ban will be reinforced. But uh, that's the best we can expect. And even if this uh, Russian plan with Syria works, okay, and uh, they managed to make Syria agree to uh, you know, eliminate all the, uh, their chemical weapons. I mean, think of Guantanamo. Nobody knows where to put the six guys from Guantanamo uh, who, who actually are completely innocent, that money is given to them, no country wants them. Who is going to want the chemical weapons from Syria? I mean, who is going to say, OK, come, come here, I'm taking them? I mean, independently from the fact that it's very dangerous to eliminate, it's dangerous to transport them, and it's dangerous to remove them. But who's going to take them? Okay, I mean that, that's that's one of the things that in, it's, it's again focusing on something that's probably not the problem, but the massacres and the people who are dying and the people who are suffering with independence of the chemical weapons problem. But again, even if it's not legal, and we go back to the legitimacy of intervening and protecting people with independence of the law. I will go a bit with the argument too. We would think exactly the same if we thought for a second that Syria can exercise self-defense and hit back in London. Well, where will we start? What, what kind of argument will we use? That's one. And Stu, I, I have been saying that, it reminds me all these uh, arguments on the legality and legitimacy of the use of armed force. Reminds me a bit about the discussions around the legality and legitimacy of using torture against some terrorists. The difference on the discourse on between torture, torture and armed force is that every commentator who tries to support torture in a specific scenarios will also have some theory or some suggestion on how to punish the perpetrators <coughs> if they get it wrong. Okay. While nobody seems to discuss what happens if the United States and the UK get it completely wrong. What happens if they use uh, chemical weapons as they seem to have used in Iraq? What happens if they use the plated uranium and white phosphorus and uh, NAPLAN? I mean, that are not clearly covered by any convention, but is that relevant or not? So what happens if they get it wrong? Uh, one of the things that uh, NATO has shown us in Kosovo that actually nothing happened. And they're, they're, um, that they can get it wrong and nothing happens. So it is, I think it just, it's very, very difficult to know what to do. My opinion right now is that the money, the efforts, everything should be really put into being the neighboring countries that are taking all the refugees and provide a lot of assistance there and to all these two million people who are fleeing and the more who are going to come. So that would be my humanitarian intervention on this and continue the political dialogue at whatever level that can help. Okay, I know there's lots of questions, so can we just can we take some questions? I'll take about five of them and then come back to you. Don't you have been willing to come in? Uh, okay, uh, I just, if you allow me, I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to cut it short. I mean, when I put my hand up saying I'm against intervention, I need to qualify this. I mean, first, as a citizen of Turkey, as a neighboring country, we have 500,000 refugees. Secondly, as an academic, politics. Yes. Is, is this about chemical weapons? I mean, let's remember the history. You know, for the first time, the chemical weapons was used by the British Empire against Ottoman armies in the Middle East in 1917 in Sinai Desert. Yes. In terms of moral consistency, 
In Halabja, again, Saddam used against Kurds, thousands of Kurds were, were, were massacred, genocide. And then we stood on, on our hand. We didn't do anything about it because Iraq was fighting, fighting for the West's interests. You know, there is no moral consistency here. And also, I don't want to be put in this position, you're either with Assad or against it. You know, of course he needs to be punished. He shouldn't get away with it. But there too, I want to share with you, is this being recorded? Because yes. Can, because Chatham House rules, if Chatham House rules, I... Um, first of all, I think this, uh, this war, uh, the, the possible war or intervention, which we are going to see in the Middle East and Syria, is not about humanitarian intervention, but of a regime change. And I think, uh, I think much of the debate surrounds humanitarian intervention, but we forget why just in Syria. I mean, what happens when, when something goes wrong in Middle East? I mean, what happened in Sri Lanka when thousands and thousands of Tamils were killed, you know? Is the South Asian life lesser than a Middle Eastern life? You know, I mean, I, I, this really bothers me. I mean, are we being consistent? Is the world community being consistent? Who is the world community? Just the five countries as we have already discussed, you know? Um, what have like what do smaller countries think about it or even like eastern europeans think about it or asians uh, south asians think about it or africans think about it i mean we're not discussing about around those premises so okay. i just wanted to ask why the focus only in syria and middle east okay thank you Shreya. yes please yeah yeah oh uh, right uh, probably answer I'm actually the uh, Commonwealth uh, liaison with the Global Institute for the Prevention of Aggression. Uh, there's lots of things I might like to uh, frankly challenge and take up with what's been said about um, the relevance of the chemical weapons, and in particular I'd, I'd like some people to go back and read up about uh, whether or not what happened in Damascus last month is a crime under international law or not, because I think that's a very involved, technical and complicated question. But clearly the other side of the coin, if I can put it that way, the other side of this debate, which the non-lawyers amongst us want to get into, is this business about what is the lawfulness of intervention. Whether or not that's because it was chemical weapons or because it was an attack against the civilian population as such, which clearly is a war crime. Now, last week I was thinking to myself, do you know what, if I put these words out as a, as a campaign to try and see if I can get support, to get them written into the Charter of the United Nations, would I get support in this country today or not? And I was just wondering if I read out these 12 words to you, Professor, you could explain to the good boys and girls here today why I'm not gonna to get too far with trying to get this amendment put into the Charter of the United Nations. And it would read something like this. Nothing, nothing contained in this charter shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state, subject only that it will not prejudice the application of enforcement measures undertaken by the Security Council where that council has determined matters in a country pose at least a threat, if not an actual breach, to the restoration and maintenance of international peace and security. Could you explain to the boys and girls why I'm not going to get too far with that? Council? Go on, you tell us. You tell us. Go on. Go on. Because it was Go written on. in 1945 in San Francisco. That's exactly the words that Article 2, Paragraph 7 say. Can Thank you very much. Read the chart of it. Great. Thank you. Uh, other comments? Yes, please. Um, we, we have gone into um, the politics of the situation. I'm not terribly interested in the political views. I've heard them all on all sides and on the whole time. What I am interested in is what we're supposed to be discussing, which is the legality and legitimacy of politics. I think Robbie has just made the point that he doesn't see how he can be legal under the United Nations Charter unless we Council. I think that is pretty widely recognized. The doctrine of uh, humanitarian intervention it is pretty widely recognized. It's not, uh, it's not really established yet. What I'm interested in is to raise the question that was raised at the beginning, which is how can you have, is there any basis for legitimacy to act when it is actually illegal? I add, I am actually, I've been a proponent of NVDA, non-violent direct action in this country. So I have argued in the UK for environmental protests that non-violent direct action is the law is bad, you do your thing. Is that not an extremely dangerous route to go down? And should we not recognize that ultimately, however unsavory it may be, if it is currently illegal under international law, then we rather have to put up with it because the alternative is some sort of international anarchy. 
exactly what we have. Okay. Thank you. John, do you have a question? Oh, you're stretching. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I have seen Mark for a long time. Uh, uh, Go ahead. Um, I thought, um, thank you, first of all, for your presentation. But I wanted to ask Professor Demeke Vodondo and Shabas what um, one of the premises that I think runs through a lot of the commentary is the premise that chemical, that the use of chemical weapons is contrary to international law. And given that Syria is not party to the Convention Against Chemical Weapons, um, do you think that it, it is still bound by that international convention, that international norm against chemical weapons on a purely legalistic level. Um, and additionally, the whole concept of war crimes that comes under the ICC statute, and you were talking about whether Syria objected to the inclusion of chemical weapons use as a war crime, um, doesn't that become redundant because Syria, again, is not a member of the ICC, of their own statute, it hasn't signed it? So on what basis do we say that Syria's actions are illegal under international law? And if that basis is treaty-based, do we ignore the fact that Syria is not a party to the treaties that make those things illegal? Okay. You want to um, go? I, 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 I mean, I think it's quite clear that in addition to the treaty at, um, level ban, it is considered customary law that the, the use of chemical weapons is prohibited. Um, um, also because, mainly because, there's no country who acknowledges the use of it. Okay? Syria has not come out, Assad, nobody has come out and said, we used them. Okay? I mean, since Saddam Hussein, we don't have a single case, of clear-cut case, of use of chemical weapons that we know who really used it. I mean, everybody denies it. The Russians against Chechenia denied it, the Sudanese denied it, the Turkish denied it. I mean, there are many reports of use of chemical weapons, and everybody denies it, which means it's clearly established in customary law that it's prohibited. Okay? They don't try to justify it. So in my opinion, that's very, very clear. Um, I, and I, I forgot to answer a point that was raised before, I'm on, because I remember uh, the evidence that's coming about who has used chemical weapons is not only the US intelligence. And if you are interested in follow, I'm following a couple of people in Twitter who are chemical weapons experts. and. They have been following this for years now, and there's quite a lot of evidence that seems to suggest that clearly Assad used chemical weapons in this occasion, okay? And that um, what is not at all cost my law is the obligation of destroying the chemical weapons, as it is asked now. Russia, Russia has been incredibly intelligent, okay? There's no obligation on the side of Syria to not have chemical weapons and not, to, and not destroy them. Okay, so this, this that the obligation doesn't exist unless they commit themselves to it. So that's that's what they are not under. They are not under the verification system. They don't. It's legal for them to have them. It's not illegal for them to use them. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Well, I mentioned that Syria itself doesn't contest the fact that it, it agrees with the prohibition on chemical weapons. It just as, and this is the case with many countries, and I think there are still many countries, even about the old 1925 gas protocol, that take the view as, we won't use it first. It's all about first use. Uh, and that's why many of them hang on to these things, because they reserve the right to use them. The United Kingdom's position is that they can, they can exercise reprisals, which would be unlawful, acts which are normally uh, unlawful, uh, if they're uh, if they're attacked or if they're in a conflict and the other side violates the laws of war, so but I, but I don't I think in terms of the prohibition of chemical weapons by international law I don't think there's any disagreement and I think there's probably a strong case to say that it's a customary prohibition. Um, again, I, as I said before, I think this is it is a bit of a red herring the discussion about the chemical weapons because it's it shouldn't it it shouldn't be the heart of the debate about. Intervention. The debate about intervention is simply whether how to do it lawfully, uh, and then if you do it lawfully, how to do it effectively so that you don't do more harm than good. To the the argument, you know, let's go back to, to 2003, where there was a, a post an ex post facto humanitarian justification. You know, if, if Blair were here today, he'd be saying, "Yes, but we got rid of Saddam Hussein. Wasn't he a bastard?" You know. And uh, we'd say, but what about the weapons of mass destruction? Say, oh, 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 that's a side issue, weapons. Well, it's true, that wasn't so important. But didn't we do good for the people of, of Iraq? And you look at Iraq now, a 
modern, prosperous, thriving democracy. Isn't it wonderful? What happens as a result? So, I mean, I think that's the scary part. Is that just, you know, if you want to, you know, pour oil on a fire, call for the U.S. Marines. They'll do it, you know. And that's the, the other part about it. it. There's nothing obvious about how that's going to be uh, a positive measure. The issue of prohibited weapons, I mean, if anybody's there looking for a doctoral thesis topic, it's still waiting. There's lots that's been written about it. But the, the issue of prohibiting weapons goes back centuries, goes back to the, you know, when the, when the British beat the French with the longbows. They wanted to, you know, that's unfair. Let's have a prohibition. And the British said, no way. We've got the longbow. You don't. We're going to keep it. And, 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 and we have this with, with prohibited weapons uh, throughout history. Uh, the, real, the real answer, ultimately, is to prohibit, is to disarm and prohibit war. That's what we have to know. I mean, I think that's the greatest, the tragedy of the modern world is that although we've developed institutions to um, prevent war, and the United Nations has been relatively, certainly entirely successful at preventing a global war, and relatively successful at preventing other interstate wars, that it hasn't made enough progress on disarmament. And, uh, and ultimately, that's the way forward. Whether they're, they're weapons of mass destruction or just ordinary weapons, that's really the key. We still have a huge budget. We could let all those people have their spare bedrooms in the, in, in the UK if we would just have one less aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, so Marines on the ground, oil and fire on us. Um, I'm going to have a response to, to, to two questions. Um, sorry, I forgot your name. But you asked a very important question very at the beginning. Um, and the what question kind was, of interventions? what kind of interventions? And what would that lead to? And to be honest with you, I think that's, that's very complicated, very difficult. You would need a lot of people coming together to come up with the best option that, as you said, would, would not cause more damage than, than, than good. But ultimately, no Syrians and no, no regional powers and transfer powers are thinking of having uh, boots on the ground. At this point, most people are thinking of limiting uh, the regime's capability of further causing more death in Syria. And that's not only by storm chemical weapons. If that's all the, the Americans are gonna, they're going to do, they might as well not do that. Because I doubt he's going to do it again. I doubt that's even the most important weapon to get rid of. I think what we need is ultimately is going to be a political solution. However, the regime hasn't found an incentive yet to sit on the table. It's only been escalating uh, with more deaths and more weapons and more innovative ways of killing Syrians and, and trying to suppress the revolution. So I think ultimately to not drag the country into a decades-long civil war and ethnic war, you would need eventually a political solution where you get all sides, all, all sex, sects, uh, between Alawi, Sunni, Christian, everyone, political parties, left and right, sit down and come up with a transitional solution. However, to get to that point, you need the guys in the Assad camp, and probably not Assad himself, but the generals around him need to be convinced that their methods are not going to work anymore, that they're not going to be able to regain control of the country because that's not going to be allowed anymore. They need to be weakened. And that's kind of, that is kind of ultimately where we need to get to, where you would support the legitimate FSA and not any kind of FSA. And that is a whole different topic we can get to in the point, if you guys want to draw on. But the idea is to support the professional defected soldiers, who are right now mostly in Damascus. The ones we're talking about, the jihadi groups, are all the way in the Northeast. And actually, if you know people on the ground, and you spoke to people on the ground, they're not doing much anymore. They're happy with the corner they have of Syria right now, and they're sitting there, and they're strengthening their hold on that part of Syria. And that's dangerous. They're actually more of a burden on the rest of Syria and the revolution than they are on the regime. The regime loves their existence. If you've noticed, it hasn't bombed them for a while. But the idea is if you support the right kind of revolutionaries by giving them more military and financial support and giving them the cover, the political cover, to actually uh, 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 bring them to the table together with their staff and convince the regime that there's no way out but to negotiate. And to do that, you might need to limit the regime's and military capabilities by destroying some of his air power, some of his heavier artillery, and obviously the WMDs. So the details of how to do that, I'm not an expert in that, but it definitely does not involve boots on the ground, and it definitely involves ultimately a political solution, uh, but the regime so far hasn't found the incentive to do so. Um, and finally, to go to the point of legitimacy, I think you made a very good point earlier when you said that the one somehow legal argument we could have made is self-determination. And I think the reason why that argument hasn't been made yet is because, again, just like the hypocrisy of the states, as usual, it does not want that argument to affect the rest of its allies in the Middle East. Because if that self-determination 
uh, is a reason enough to change regimes that would affect its allies in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and, and the rest of the Middle East and on rising up. So the, I think many powers are avoiding that argument because that's a slippery slope from their point of view because that could empower many other uh, nations in the region uh, to demand self-determination the way the way Syrians have. So I think, I mean, that's my own, obviously, theory, but I think that's the reason why that hasn't been brought up. But it's a, it is a sound argument, together with several other sound arguments that could be brought together. But again, as you guys noticed from today's discussion, um, law, international law cannot be separated from po politics. And at the end of the day, all these legal issues have been politicized. At the end of the day, it does come down to five nations voting whether a war is legal or not. And in my opinion, that's not good enough, but unfortunately, we're stuck with that right now. Okay, we have we have eight minutes left, and we're going to stop exactly on, at two thirty, and we're going to give you some food as well. So, for, for, as a reward for patiently listening to this, are there any questions you want to raise? Are there any statements you want to make with regards to pro intervention or anti intervention? Are there any questions you want to ask about the FSA? Please do it now. We have very little time left. John, please, and then Susan. Yeah. What John. Uh, it, it would be the effect on the United Nations itself. The United Nations, 60 years old. Is it going the way of the League of Nations? Okay. Thank you, John. Susan? I just wanted to ask whether you think technology is sufficiently advanced that just the chemical weapons could be Okay. Any other questions? Maureen? Uh, well, um, the reference to 45 and now, and um, Bill's putting uh, words into Tony Blair's mouth about um, <laughs> Uh, human rights and... There's a lot of other things he'd rather put in his mouth, believe me. Whether, you know, I mean, human rights now seem to trump national sovereignty. And I wondered whether you thought there had been a change in the United Nations. I mean, some of us who are old, not many of us who must have been old, would be in the universities in the 1960s, remember George Cannon and so on, when there was never the exact coincidence between the United States' national interest and mor morality. It, it, it was not... It, you know, the, the United States view of moral view of the world not regarded one nation in particular on, on everywhere else. Now, national sovereignty doesn't seem to be uh, to the core of, of, I mean, since it isn't a requirement to join the United Nations that you have to be democratic state anyhow, how can always the argument of, of, of human rights trump the, 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 the national sovereignty and this talk about regime change and so on of, of, the, of the states that are party to it? Yeah, thanks. Mark? Um, I was going to ask what, what his sources are inside Syria, what, what is it that informs his view of how the conflicts should Okay. So, any other questions? So we have four. Yes, please, Philip. Moving beyond Syria, you were omnipotent. How would you change the international framework to deal with a Syrian type situation Well, they don't, do only have about four minutes to answer that, Phil, but we'll try. <laughs> Okay, so, so uh, a number of questions there. Relevance of the UN, uh, is the technical capacity, does it exist to target only the, the chemical weapons? Maureen's question on Article 27, which was raised earlier by a colleague at the back there, what's the relevance of that sovereignty? The question on uh, sources in Syria, which you may or may not want to reveal, uh, certainly on podcast, and then Phil's question, what would be the ideal regime? Anybody, you have a minute each. I want to very fast, one to what did you say that I, I don't think we should ever go on a race to the bottom. Reason that we didn't intervene before should never be used to stay put again. I think that's my view. And, that, um, and I just want to add also on the Article 27 and everything that they, there was a fantastic proposal. So if I could do something, I would make the proposal of the S5, it was called, that proposed a reform of the Security Council, which will imply that the, vote, the veto will not work in cases of crimes against humanity and war crimes should go forward. So that's the first thing I will, if I was omnipotent, I would make the veto disappear for certain cases at least as a more or less easy measure and uh, in a way, but I'm not sure if that would be good. And I, I will try to protect the refugees at the moment. Uh, Susan Pascal, I'm not sure what you meant. The, what was the question? Can, is it possible technologically, so, so is that right, Susan, to just yes. target the chemical weapons? I don't think so, but I mean, not only that, it's the, the real, the, this illusion that there's a general ban on chemical weapons is not real too, okay? I'm, I'm saying I cannot enter into the details, but, it, details, but this non-lethal weapons program of NATO, for instance, is based largely on chemical weapons, and the only time they were really tested was when Russia entered the Chechenia theater, thinking they were only going to sleep people, and they killed lots of them. 
because they were only meant to sleep. So, and, and actually, the NATO recommendation on the last report was that NATO nations must remain vigilant against the development of specific regimes which unnecessarily limit the ability to use non-lethal weapons. So, actually, there's no technology clearly to stop them. It's still evolving to create new ones, and quite hideous ones, and uh, there's no clear regime on it at all. Okay. So. Bill? And I said, I'm going to give you the last word. All right. Uh, well, the first thing is greater vigilance about maintaining the international rule of law. Um, Phil, your question about how to uh, reform the, the UN or how to improve it. The uh, current system where you have the Security Council that effectively has a monopoly on the use of force and where its agenda is dominated by the five permanent members, although it's theoretically possible that you could have nine elected members authorize the use of force over the negative vote of the five permanent members providing they didn't veto. That's theoretically possible, but it would never happen. That could be made more uh, credible, more legitimate, more democratic by adding uh, states from the South who are absent, by adding uh, at least one African state and a Latin American state, and by bringing India into the Security Council. So greater legitimacy and maybe bringing in some small countries too as, as being representatives of the global community. Uh, and that would make it better. I think it's an imperfect system, but it's better than no system, and it has it has worked. John, I, I think, I, I don't think you should look at the United Nations as being like the League of Nations. The League of Nations never actually gained uh, universal acceptance at any point, and it went into a tailspin in early in the 1930s, long before the Second World War broke out. I think the United Nations is a great, great success story, um, and that it requires strengthening and, and improvement. I would not try to go back and revive Article 2, Paragraph 7, which is about the United Nations abstaining in matters that are allegedly of the internal of internal concern. One of the great strengths and the accomplishments of the United Nations is that alongside the Security Council, we now have a second council called the Human Rights Council that focuses on all these issues. And the council yesterday issued another report on uh, atrocities in Syria, which is the council doesn't have enough teeth, it doesn't have enough strength, but it's, it's young and it's cutting its teeth and getting more and more uh, robust. So um, I, I think that all of this has to be strengthened within a legal framework. It's in the interests, well, it's in the interests of Syria, whoever's running it, the Syrian people know that they're better protected by international law than by allowing large powerful countries. What region of the world, Syria is one example, but we could, you're victims of the fact that great powers sat around and decided they took out a map, Sykes and Pico, 100 years ago, and drew lines on a map. And, and you're living with the consequences of that to this day. So small countries, above all, need to rely on international law. It protects them. That's why it's so obnoxious when someone like Cameron says, well, we don't need international law. What the, the quote I gave from the International Court of Justice, I love that quote because this was the International Court of Justice in its first case basically saying to London, you know, you always thought Britannia ruled the waves, but it doesn't work that way anymore. We have the United Nations. You have to follow the United Nations and you can't just do whatever you want. And so that's, I think, got to be out there in, in the long term. That's better for Syria than suggesting that just go and do anything you want, because you'll pay the price for that later, I'm sure of it. Anas, the last word, quite literally. So um, to respond to your question first, um, I have been involved with a lot of actors since the be very beginning of the revolution. I've touched with a lot of them. I uh, have worked in a lot of, uh, with a lot of agencies to document some of the human rights abuses. And more, more recently, over the past year and a half, I've traveled uh, frequently to the region, whether it's neighboring countries or actually into the liberated parts of Syria where I've interviewed many activists and spoken to a lot of people. I'm still in touch with a lot of them. So um, I speak out of personal experience, I speak out of my friends' personal experiences, and I speak off of uh, my recent travels. The second, I actually want to respond finally to your question when you were asking me about, when you just asked everyone about the uh, sovereignty versus uh, humanitarian. And I would say in the case of Syria now, uh, in case of Iraq, that was a very interesting point, uh, that Iraq's sovereignty uh, should have triumphed uh, whatever other reasons. Uh, was used to wage that war. But when it comes to Syria, the issue of sovereignty is a bit more, it's not as straightforward, because if you look at the Arab League now, the Arab League believes that the SNC is the uh, representative of the Syrian people right now. 
uh, many Western nations have. With my issues with SNCs and all my uh, hesitation to uh, uh, really uh, support them fully, um, the fact that the Syrian regime is no longer the eyes of most in the international community and most important the Arab League right now is no longer the representative of the Syrian people. Um, that the issue of sovereignty now changes when the SNC and a, a vast number of Syrians, whether they are uh, armed rebels or civilians, are asking for some sort of intervention. Um, it's no longer a sovereignty issue as, as straightforward as, as it would be in some other cases. So I just wanted to point that one out. Right. Well, colleagues, it's, it's 2.32, I think, by my watch. So I think we should bring this to a close. Please do thank our speakers in the traditional manner.